Hi everyone, welcome back. So let's start our lecture. And this first part of the lecture will invite you to reflect on the multiple crises that we are facing and it will introduce you to social ecological transition proposals as an answer to those crises. So the first part of this lecture is divided in uh, two main blocks. We will first review um, the complex crises that uh, we are facing, the relation between economical, environmental, climate and social crises. Uh, we'll review the question of planet limits and the need for ecological conversion. Uh, we'll review indicators like the overshoot day and see the main tendencies in production chains and uh, the, externality, the externalities that are produced by the industry which sustain our lifestyle. And uh, in a second block, we will review what does excessive resources exploitation produce uh, and we will look at the world through the lens of environmental justice uh, and review phenomena such as environmental conflicts, environmental racism, ecological and climate debt, so on and so forth. The deep incompatibility between the ecological limits of the planet and the dominant production and consumption model is a core element of a complex reflection advanced for decades now by many intellectuals, activists, trade unionists, workers, local administrators and entrepreneurs who decided not to surrender. The necessity of such reflection is supported by many indicators data, research and studies, statistics and warnings provided by many political and economic analysts and scientists. To quote only one, we shall speak about the overshoot day indicator. Calculated by the Global Footprint Network, it measures the relation between the consumption of resources and the bioreproductive capacity of the planet to identify each year the day in which we already consume too much to allow the natural system to reproduce itself. Moreover, its scientific value, this indicator has a strong symbolic value as it summarized in one date the compelling urgency for a transition towards a fairer and more socially and environmentally sustainable poly industrial policies and resources management models. So to provide you with some concrete example of the other shoot day, it has been calculated that in 1993 um, the other shoot day occurred on the 21st of October. In 2003, it was on the 22nd of September, and last year, in 2015, it was on the 19th of August. So this increasing speed is a clear symptom of the so far relentless run of a natural resources hoarding. And at this pace, we globally consume in seven months and a half all that the Earth is able to regenerate. So for the rest of the year, we are basically ransacking our planet, preventing nature to reproduce itself, notwithstanding our lives depend on it. Um, if you look at the ecological footprint uh, graphic, you will see also a representation of the percentage of biocapacity that we used uh, in time. So in uh, 1961, we we're using 54% of the biocapacity. In 1985, 114% of the biocapacity, so we had already overstepped. And uh, in 2012, we were using 150 six percent of the biocapacity of the earth. Outsourcing, um, that is to say when you move exploitation or production activities from one place to another, um, this increases the externalization of negative effects both at national and international levels, in particular where there are less guarantees regarding human and environmental rights and or in um, any areas already sacrificed to productive processes. In order to tackle the economical, employment, social and environmental crises seriously and in an integrated manner, a milestone stand in dealing with the issue of outsourcing through a social and environmental perspective, imposing stronger binds to companies and more rigid controls both at national and international levels. Another milestones regard the continuous increase in fossil fuels exploitation and consumption. Let's look at two sectors, oil and gas and coal. 
We witness in Europe the expansion of the extractive frontier both onshore and offshore that are pushed by policies oriented to increase fossil fuel extraction as a measure to boost the economy, as it is for example the case in Italy, in Greece or Spain. If you look at coal, it remains an important asset in Europe. Bulgaria extracts it and Italia burns a lot of coal to produce electricity. Those tendencies underline the gap between the declaration of Eton for many governments in regards with climate change, the action that those governments actually take, and the necessity of a transition towards a low society, a low carbon society. Italy is an example. While the Minister of the Environment talked about taking commitments to reduce emissions to remain below 1.5 degree, the National Energy Development Strategy, reinforced by the decree Sblocca Italia, which means unlock Italy, forces to double fossil fuel extraction and open new extraction fields, including in naturalistic reserves, to implement unconventional extractive technique and develop more energy transportation infrastructures, like gas hubs, pipelines, so on and so forth, as well as further new incinerator. A third milestone regards food and agriculture, as food industrial production, including livestock, is responsible for about half of greenhouse gases emissions, as the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development reports. The 15% of these are strictly related to agriculture itself, while the rest is produced by deforestation related to industrial agriculture methods, as well as of the industrial transformation, transport and sale of food products. The agriculture system is also very meaningful for what regards food wasting. Only in Italy, the Ministry of Environment reports that 3% of energy consumption can be attributed to food wasting accounted from the production phase up to our table. Bologna University accounted that in Italy, 5 million tons of CO2 were related to food wasting, including the waste management part. Poverty increase, climate heat, but so many resources are still wasted that way. To invert the tendency, there is no secret. Progressively stop intensive production and monoculture, avoid fertilizers and pesticides, and support traditional and biological local agricultures. But as green is trendy, the industrial sector tried to convince the collective subconscious that all is fine through greenwashing. Let's sell something called green and all will be better. But that's much more complicated. And greenering product does not mean implementing concrete and socially and environmentally sustainable conversion. A real ecological and social transition needs to be planned in every step of the production chain. Every chain is generally composed of four phases. Production, distribution, consumption and disposal. For a product to be ecologically sustainable, all its production chain should be as well, starting with the supply of raw materials. Moreover, many projects and industrial and energy productions based on the so-called green economy actually produce the same logic of hoarding, accumulation and profit that are at the root of our current crises. So which change could ever be produced if the same system is reproduced under other names? It is a delicate discourse and issue, but all that is called green is not good. Many of green economy projects, in particular large-scale ones, does not bring any economical and social benefit for the community as they are moved by a logic of profit and often contributes to impact the quality life and future of those territories. An example is for example solar energy development in Puglia in South Italy which was implemented at large and medium scale invading thousands of hectares of agricultural land in areas dedicated mostly to agriculture and tourism. If it did increase the country production capacity in renewable energy even though without any specific regional or national strategy, it also sacrificed many rural and touristic territories without any form of economical benefit or form of restribution shared locally. No protection strategy for local and traditional agriculture, no transition of energy production. That means that the contaminating energy plants using coal or fossil fuel are still active and this plan they remain active. No adequate electricity grid to handle renewable energy production has been installed, so on and so forth. You will have the opportunity, through the small case study video I should realize, to review a good practice example from this area in regards with alternative community management of renewable energy, 
uh, an experience that has that was born in opposition to the general train of unregulated renewable energy development and uh, as a way to benefit to both the community and the environment. Hi everyone, welcome back. So let's start our lecture. And this first part of the lecture will invite you to reflect on the multiple crises that we are facing and it will introduce you to social ecological transition proposals as an answer to those crises. So to better understand um, the social conflict that might arise from the management of natural resources, its use and disposal, um, let's review uh, the concept of environmental conflict. So an environmental conflict is a social conflict that arise from uh, issues related to the distribution of the nat natural capital uh, that is needed for human life in a given territories. It is generally the imbalanced access and distribution of natural resources, but also the environmental burdens that are uh, at the root of an environmental conflict. An environmental conflict developed itself uh, when there is a qualitative or quantitative diminution of the available environmental resources, uh, water, air, biodiversity, land, raw materials and other limited natural goods that they need uh, and that are taken for use for other activities. Um, and when there is also an imbalanced distribution of environmental burdens, by environmental burdens we mean um, the contamination, pollution uh, and the waste produced by such activities. For there to be a conflict, uh, you need people. So the first characteristic, of course, of the environmental conflict is that it is uh, an opposition, a resistance from civil society, from citizens, from local communities that are impacted or threatened by a given project and that organize themselves in order to defend the environment, their territories, uh, the commons, but also their right to live uh, in a safe environment. In the last decades, we can note an increase in the number of environmental conflicts. Uh, we can see that this phenomenon uh, multiplicates itself, first of all, because there's a progressive diminution uh, and depletion of the natural resources available. The more we consume, the less resources are available, so the more we will run after it and try to get even the more difficult resources to take. Uh, and this leads to an increase, of course, of the conflicts related to that. Um, it's also to see in a context of the multiple crises that we reviewed before. So, of course, all is connected the worst because the economy it tries to uh, boost itself through the use of natural resources, um, providing no concrete answer to other crises like the environmental and the climatic one, while trying to uh, provide support also for employment rates. Um, we have also to take into account, uh, in the context of environmental conflict, of the acceleration there is uh, in controlling the, the exploitation of the raw material, um, and in particular the key natural resources that we need. That would be uh, oil and gas, that would be uh, all the metals that are used for high technology, that would be gold, and so on and so forth. The deep incompatibility between the ecological limits of the planet and the dominant production and consumption model is a core element of a complex reflection advanced for decades now by many intellectuals, activists, trade unionists, workers, local administrators and entrepreneurs who decided not to surrender. The necessity of such reflection is supported by many indicators data, research and studies, statistics and warnings provided by many political and economic analysts and scientists. To quote only one, we shall speak about the overshoot day indicator. Calculated by the Global Footprint Network, it measures the relation between the consumption of resources and the bioreproductive capacity of the planet to identify each year the day in which we already consume too much to allow the natural system to reproduce itself. Moreover, its scientific value, this indicator has a strong symbolic value as it's summarized in one date 
a compelling urgency for a transition towards a fairer and more socially and environmentally sustainable poly industrial policies and resources management. So let's see what environmental conflicts uh, are caused by, what, uh, what are the roots of their emergence. Um, we try to think of three main categories of causes of environmental conflict. One is the sector of economic, political and administrative decisions, uh, which basically corresponds to um, exploitation, production and disposal projects that might be proposed by uh, private or public companies, uh, authorized by authorities and implemented in the given territories. When there is a situation of threat or the evidence of an impact uh, rather than an impact already uh, occurred, um, the population organize itself to protest uh, and let their situation to be known and ask for its addressment. Um, this kind of uh, protests also arise from processes of non-decision making, um, that is to say when there is a missing political or administrative intervention or an ineffectiveness of the measure in a situation where they are needed. Um, to make an example, we could think um, of the polluted areas that are left by companies without cleaning up and in case where government doesn't clean up neither, they are just left by alone and they can be um, the subject of a struggle from a local community that is asking for cleaning up and reparation. And finally, a third sector would has to do with political choices uh, and also the impact of international organization policies and agreement. Now we are talking about sector of trade and finance and security, uh, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. So the first part of this lecture is divided in uh, two main blocks. We will first review um, the complex crises that uh, we are facing, the relation between economical, environmental, climate and social crises. Uh, we'll review the question of planet limits and the need for ecological conversion. Uh, we'll review indicators like the overshoot day and see the main tendencies in production chains and uh, the, externality, the externalities that are produced by the industry which sustain our lifestyle. And in a second block, we will review what does excessive resources exploitation produce. Uh, and we will look at the world through the lens of environmental justice uh, and review phenomena such as environmental conflicts, environmental racism, ecological and climate debt, so on and so forth. But environmental uh, conflicts also answers uh, social, social economical impacts that development projects have um, because uh, they often produce uh, depletion of the quality of life, they might produce this forced displacement of local population, like it's in the case when there are uh, fumigation of pesticides. Um, they can, of course, often the conflict dynamics and the power of the cooperation uh, produces destruction of the community equilibrium, uh, often using corruption within the community. Um, we can also note uh, the economical uh, loss for the local economy that are related to uh, the implementation of uh, major exploitation and production project and also an increase in criminalization um, of the activists that are struggling against the project. Uh, we can also um, see the cultural aspects of impacts that those projects have uh, 
uh, in particular in uh, rural and indigenous communities, this brings to acculturation and loss of customs and traditions. Hi everyone, welcome back. So let's start our lecture. And this first part of the lecture will invite you to reflect on the multiple crises that we are facing and it will introduce you to social ecological transition proposals as an answer to those crises. If you are interested uh, in uh, environmental conflicts and also if you want to know more about uh, mapping environmental conflicts, I will suggest you to review uh, the website of the Documentation Center on Environmental Conflict, which is based in Rome, uh, on his website, which is www.cdca.it. Um, from there, you will find the link to two uh, Atlas Online Mapping Environmental Conflict in the world and in Italy. So you can access the Global Environmental Justice Atlas through uh, the CDCA website and there you will be able to browse almost 2,000 cases of environmental conflicts in the world that has been mapped by over 25 organizations and universities all around the world through the EGEL project. Um, and you can also review the Italian Atlas of Environmental Conflict, uh, which has been an experiment from the EJ Atlas to build a national map through direct participation of local committees engaged in environmental conflict. So we have over 100 cases mapped over all the country. The um, information is unfortunately only available in Italian, but you can browse some Italian conflicts from the Global Environmental Justice Atlas. Related to the lens of environmental conflict, uh, we can talk briefly about uh, the vision of the environmentalism of the poor. Uh, Juan Martinez Allier, which is an ecological economist uh, from uh, Barcelona, refers by it to new environmentalism that is arising globally from local environmental conflict actors. This manifests itself through the struggle of poor sectors of society involved in environmental conflicts against a government or a company in order to protect their rights, their health, their lives, their culture and autonomy. Uh, even if there is no direct identification to environmentalism, the poorest sector of population, as mainly threatened uh, by polluting activities, are those who mostly act for nature conservation and protection against contamination. The NIMBY concept, uh, which means not in my backyard, indicates group of citizens who organize themselves to protest against a given project, that would be transport, industry, energy plant, etc. Not because they are against a given technology or production system or other, but because they just don't want it close by where they live. Unfortunately, this concept, mainly used by mass media, companies and governments often means to discredit local committees who actually work for alternatives and oppose not only a single local project but a type of production, energy, infrastructure models or the system as a whole, networking with other social groups and stakeholders at various levels. So always be careful when you read NIMBY because it might be just a question of perspective. So to go from the local to the global, uh, let's review the ecological debt concept. Uh, this concept aims to calculate the debt accumulated by the global north toward the global south in regard with two things. On one hand, the exportation of raw materials from the global south at a very low price that do not include environmental damages costs produced in the places of extraction and or transformation, nor the contamination at global level. And on the other hand, the use for free or very low cost of ecological services or environmental spaces like the atmosphere, water, soil for disposal of waste. This is the definition that Mar Juan Martinez Salier gives of the ecological uh, concept, the ecological depth concept. It has been developed at the beginning of the 90s 
by Political Ecology Institute in Chile and then adapted by various organizations as the NGO Friends of the Earth, for example. This concept is based on the idea of environmental justice for which everyone has the right to access the same amount of resources and space. Those who use more have that in regard who to who use less. That work not only for geographical north and south, but also for the global south areas in the northern countries and vice versa. By this we mean the depth between who consumes more and who consumes less. And the same concept applies to climate issues. In this case we talk about climate depth. In the run-up to the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Summit, large parts of the global justice movement united around a push for the concept of climate debt. Later defined at the People's Summit in Bolivia in 2010, climate debt implies that the overconsumption of the available capacity of the Earth, atmosphere and climate system to absorb greenhouse gases by the developed countries has run up a climate debt to developing countries and Mother Earth. In the EJ Atlas, you can also consult uh, what is called featured map with our geographical maps where other indicators are uploaded. In this case, you can see an example of a map of what uh, can be seen as the carbon debt between the different countries. And how you see in this picture, you can see um, more brown, darker countries are those with the more depths and the more blue countries as the countries that are less uh, climate debt. Hi everyone, welcome back. So let's start our lecture. And this first part of the lecture will invite you to reflect on the multiple crises that we are facing and it will introduce you to social ecological transition proposals as an answer to those crises. So it is since the beginning of this uh, lecture that we are going around and around uh, of an important paradigm, which is the one of environmental justice. And we've seen environmental conflict, but when we talk more generally, we should see uh, and understand what is environmental injustice. Um, if you look uh, at the social environmental inequalities that are produced by the economic system, at the global and local level, both in the north and in the south of the globe, you will see environmental injustice. Environmental justice as a paradigm and also as a social movement has to see its emergence from the civil rights campaign uh, for environmental justice in the 19, in the, in the 90s, sorry, in the United States. Um, this is precisely in the Cancer Alley, an area that is uh, intensely industrialized, industrialized through uh, the border of the Mississippi River, that arise uh, this struggle for environmental justice. And then the concept was taken up by philosopher in the 1990s, and then sociologists, geographers, economists and politicians also took interest uh, and social movement developed around uh, the environmental justice banner. It is also interesting to see how the institution has provided their own definition uh, of this paradigm. For the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Environmental Justice, um, Environmental justice is a fair treatment, a meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulation and policies. It will be achieved when everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn and work. So this definition is interesting because you can see how it underlines the importance of low regulation in policies in limiting environmental injustices but also um, the fundamental rights of having access to an healthy environment. 
the South African Environmental Justice Networking Forum defines environmental justice as the social transformation directed towards meeting basic human needs and enhancing our quality of life, economic quality, health care, housing, human rights, environmental protection and democracy. In linking environmental and social justice issues, the environmental justice approach seeks to challenge the abuse of power which results in poor people having to suffer the effects of environmental damage caused by the greed of others. Uh, this other definition provided by civil society is interesting because uh, what it brings uh, forward are the importance of combining environmental and social issues uh, and also for underlining that environmental injustice mostly affects poor people so we are here really back to the uh, concept of environmental racism. But from institution also comes worrying perspectives. Um, it's interesting to quote the leak from the former chief economist of the World Bank, um, Summers, which um, discussed with a colleague saying that um, why shouldn't the World Bank be encouraging more migration of the dirty industry to the least developed country? He said, a given amount of health impairing pollution should be done in the country with the lowest cost, which will be the country with the lowest wages. I think the economic logic between behind dumping a lot of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable and we should face up to that. Behind this logic, we can check that many of contaminating industry, both in the global north and in the global south, are located in less advantaged communities. That is what we call the sacrificed communities. The concept of environmental injustice arose out of recognition that some communities, mostly those more, more vulnerable, economically less advantaged, are disproportionately subject to higher levels of environmental risk than others. In relation with sacrificed communities, we have to talk about environmental racism that we uh, mentioned earlier. There, we can see that most contaminating activities are concentrated in areas inhabited by most disadvantaged communities. Um, the terminology of environmental racism uh, comes too from the United States and the environmental justice movement, and it was created to underline how the lateral effects of industrialization were connected to racial discrimination in the United States. But further the racial perspective, which does exist, the discrimination is related to social and economical conditions where there are less advantaged communities. There is major concentration on environmental risks and environmental racism has to be understood not just in terms of race but in terms of um, less advantaged populations. Um, the Italian example uh, is interesting. We have 60% of the contaminated areas, which is recognized as a national priorities, that corresponds uh, to areas where it's located population with fewer social and economical opportunities. So this is not the case. We talk about ecological debt and climate debt. We talked about environmental justice and now let's briefly review the perspective of climate justice. Um, the, the American NGO Corp Watch, uh, its reports on greenhouse gangsters versus climate justice, uh, gives the first definition of climate justice in 1999. Um, to quote them, they're right. Um, it means, first of all, removing the causes of global warming and allowing the earth to continue to nourish our lives and those of all living beings beings. This entails radically reducing emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Climate justice means opposing destruction wreaked by greenhouse gangsters at every step of the production and distribution process, from a moratorium on new oil exploration to stopping the poisoning of communities by refinery emissions, from drastic domestic productions in auto emissions to the promotion of efficient and effective public transportation. And the same concept applies 
to climate issues. In this case, we talk about climate debt. In the run-up to the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Summit, large parts of the global justice movement united around a push for the concept of climate debt. Later defined at the People's Summit in Bolivia in 2010, climate debt implies that the overconsumption of the available capacity of the Earth, atmosphere and climate system to absorb greenhouse gases by the developed countries has run up a climate debt to developing countries and Mother Earth. 